Well, good morning, everybody. Um, appreciate your joining us today. Uh, it's a new day, new world. And uh, today we have the pleasure of uh, having Dr. Josh Weiderman, who was a uh, fellow and spent one year at uh, Mekle University in Northern Ethiopia, uh, following his uh, fellowship in pediatric otolaryngology. Presently, he's, a, I believe, a senior fellow at the Mayo Clinic in New York, Rochester, New York. And uh, he's going to uh, give us a lecture today on uh, an individual model of sustainable global surgery, how to perform airway surgery in places that never had done it before. Um, and uh, I want to reach out to our friends in Ethiopia, especially um, since there is the beginning of what seems to be a civil war going on in northern Ethiopia. Um, uh, at the present time in the Tigray region, which is the region where Josh spent his uh, year. And it's also the region where Global ENT has a uh, temporal bone lab and trains doctors at the uh, University of uh, Ethiopia in Mekele. So with that said, I will now let Josh proceed with his lecture and I'm sure we're gonna all find it to be very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner, and, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, and for those of you with a video going on right now, uh, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me well? All right, perfect. I'm using a, a new microphone system right now, so I just wanted to make sure that it's working. So uh, as Dr. Wagner pointed out, um, I spent uh, just over a year in Mekele, Ethiopia, helping to create uh, and run a otolaryngology program there. Uh, and Dr. Wagner's group had been uh, working with this institution for quite some time, so there's already a lot set up. And he's the one who kind of influenced me to go uh, to this area. And currently, I'm in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. There's actually two cities in the United States that have the same name, um, but I'm in the much colder version of it. And right now it's about uh, zero degrees Celsius and disgustingly rainy outside. So uh, that's my backdrop. I hope the weather is much better wherever you guys are. And uh, let's go ahead into this. I wanted to give you uh, a view of uh, my particular model of global surgery, uh, in keeping in mind that I am just an individual um, and, and there are many ways to do global surgery. And I also want to point your attention out to this uh, animal that is, uh, happens to be limping across the road right now. And uh, try to think in your mind what animal that is. And as a hint, it's, it's from the Lion King, if that helps whatsoever. But we'll, it'll become important later on. Um, now, to, for a few disclosures, this uh, lecture does contain identifying patient information, um, but they have uh, signed uh, consents and there are no financial disclosures. Now, while that was playing, could anyone hear the sound of it? I'm gonna play it one more time just to make sure. Any luck on sound for anybody? Okay, I'm actually gonna stop sharing for a second and reshare. All right. And let's try that again. There's down that time from anybody. All right. Got it. Uh, sorry, the video people, can you give me a thumbs up one more time if you heard that sound? Because I missed it last time. All right. Well, if you can't hear it, um, 
Yeah, okay, you can hear it, wonderful. It is a bit quiet. But what I wanted you to appreciate uh, in that short video is that this young child is having inspiratory strider. So you can see uh, the inspiratory issues from retraction uh, around the trachea, but also around the rib. Uh, and then also something that's not so unique to Ethiopia, and you will see many other places abroad, is that one of the very first levels of healthcare are traditional healers. And uh, in our particular region, traditional healers will often burn the areas of the skin that are most affected. Uh, and so in this particular child, because they were having breathing issues, the skin was burned multiple times. And now this doesn't happen all at one time. So all of these burns probably happened over months of time. It kind of gives you a chronology of the problem here. But nevertheless, this patient presented to us with severe inspiratory strider, um, was cachectic, failure to thrive, uh, and clearly in respiratory distress. Now, this is the scope view, the flexible scope view of what was going on. And so you can see this ball valving uh, yellow apparatus that's kind of stuck, it looks to the anterior vocal cords, I would imagine, right? And the kid was in distress, so uh, we needed to make a plan pretty much immediately. So I wanted to ask you guys the plan, and you can respond in chat with either A or B as your decision here. So in this scenario, what would you do with this eight-year-old? Would you perform an awake trach and then uh, deal with the lesion? Or would you give gas inhalation induction, achieve spontaneous respiration, and then perform a bronch and remove the lesion? So take a moment to think about that and put your uh, answers in chat. By the way, this is not graded, so be brave. I'll give about 20 more seconds for any more brave people out there. All right, the consensus is option B. Now, I totally agree with you. Um, now, you can make the argument, especially in adults, that performing an awake trach on a glottic lesion uh, is not a bad idea because when you induce anesthesia, you may lose the ability to ventilate that patient uh, due to collapse of the airway based on circumference of the neck or how big the tongue is or whatever. So in an adult who can tolerate an awake trach, that makes an okay sense. But in an eight-year-old who is failure to thrive, barely conscious, uh, an awake trach may not be a successful procedure. And in fact, you don't get that tongue collapse or uh, neck wall collapse when you give gas inhalation and achieve spontaneous respiration. Um, it actually makes the airway safer in some regards because you're creating linear uh, airflow. Uh, but the problem is, is that everybody's wrong because this is what actually happened. Our anesthesia team, uh, which in many institutions around the world are not actually physicians, but are uh, physician extenders in order to bring anesthesia to more rural areas, which is, was the case in Mekele as well, um, they bring a lifeless child who is not breathing, fully anesthetized under general anesthesia, uh, to your bedside. Later when I asked why this happened, uh, it was because the child was crying and they wanted the child to stop crying. So they were successful in that, uh, but they created a very dangerous situation which I could no longer control. If you have spontaneous breathing, then the child will keep that respiration uh, and oxygenization themselves. But if you're completely apneic, then you have to give positive pressure in order to ventilate through a mask or intubating. And in this case, intubation was not necessarily possible. We weren't sure at the time. Uh, so we went straight to bag masking. And luckily, we're able to push air passed quite easily. So we sat there and waited because that was a safe airway until the child started to spontaneously breathe again. But we are insanely lucky that that was possible. 
So now let's look at the video of the actual intubation. So this is the kid spontaneously breathing. And uh, this is a technique I love to use called a Salinger technique, where the endotracheal tube is actually around the endoscope. And then you just slide the endotracheal tube around the lesion and into the airway while you're staring at it. And so it kind of guarantees that you're in the airway in a very safe manner. Uh, and you can see this, the black crescent moon at the top, and, and most of you are probably cringing at this moment, um, but it was already broken. I didn't do that, I promise. All right, and then once the lesion was removed, uh, you can tell it had this kind of pedicled base and the anterior glottis was completely stenosed. So this was some sort of longstanding uh, pathogenesis and it came back as just a granuloma. So this was uh, likely related to some infectious disease that occurred over a long period of time, uh, which could have been tuberculosis. It's really uh, unsure you know, what the original etiology was. So the main part of my talk today is to try to understand how do we go from something so dangerous um, of a situation into something that is safe and a sustainable teaching environment for pediatric airway. And if I didn't mention before, um, I did do my fellowship in pediatrics. Uh, in Ethiopia, I did all ages, uh, but now my specialty at the Mayo Clinic uh, is airway reconstruction in children. So this is kind of my passion. A um, little bit of background about me. Uh, I grew up on the east coast of the United States in uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. I went to medical school and residency at the George Washington University, which is in Washington, D.C. Um, and it was there I started to think about global surgery and how I could be involved in global surgery. So I started to investigate what the possibilities were, what my role could be as an otolaryngologist. And so uh, my obvious question was, is there any need for me to move globally and try to do this elsewhere? And so some of the um, most important evidence for the usefulness of global surgery came out in 2014 through the Lancet Commission, uh, where this massive group of really excellent researchers uh, kind of showed the evidence that we are way behind in our surgical care and it's been neglected. They even called it the neglected stepchild of, of medicine. Uh, and up until this point of 2014, the emphasis had been given to primary health uh, and primary care rather than surgical care, thinking that it was too expensive to do so. So uh, this map on the right is a heat map showing in the dark red, limited access to, medicine, to surgical care. Uh, and so, you can see in the Horn of Africa where I ended up going, um, it, access to care is extremely difficult. And overall, some astonishing facts of 5 billion people don't have access to surgery. 33 million people uh, go through catastrophic expenditure just to get surgery, meaning they have to completely sell everything they own in order just to travel to a hospital. Not even talking about paying for healthcare bills, but just the travel. Um, and, th and that's a staggering thing to me. And then 143 million additional surgeries need to happen in order to reach the burden of disease that, that we know exists in the world. And that's just a guesstimate. It's probably way worse because we don't, we don't actually know. And one of the biggest problems in healthcare uh, globally is the, called the three delay framework. And this happens even in developed countries, but uh, one, there needs to be recognition of an illness. Yes, you need to identify that something's wrong with you, but then also identify that that can be fixed somewhere. And then once you eventually come to that decision, do you then ask family members or local healers uh, or your next door neighbor to help you with that disease? Or do you immediately travel to a hospital? So that's, that's what delay one is. Uh, delay two is, how long does it actually take to reach the healthcare facility? This is not only just physical travel time. For some people in Ethiopia, it took them three days to walk and hitchhike to get to our facility. But also, what if you go to a facility and they can't even treat you? So you walk into a local hospital, but well, they don't have ENT, so they can't actually do anything. So you, now you have to go to another hospital. 
So that's delay two. And then delay three, which is perhaps the most costly and devastating, is that when you finally get to the correct hospital, you don't actually get the care you need or you get inappropriate care. Um, and, and that's the final delay. Um, and, and that's what people are investigating now as the potential biggest barrier to global surgery. And in regards to getting appropriate care at that third step is looking at the safety of perioperative medicine and is anesthesia actually safe globally? So this was a uh, retrospective uh, meta-analysis uh, that was done by a group in Canada that I actually worked with right after Ethiopia. Uh, and they showed that if you look over time from the 1920s to 2010, the uh, adverse event rate is decreasing over time. And so in 2010, we're actually uh, way better than we used to be in, in 1930. And this is worldwide data, which looking at this graph is excellent because you're saying things are getting better over time. But if you actually change the data around to look at uh, this exact same plot in terms of uh, gross domestic product or low income countries or middle income countries, you get kind of a scary picture. So this is the human development index. Uh, and is this how well a society is functioning essentially in terms of goods and access to healthcare and, and those sort of things. So the countries up towards one are those high income countries like the United States and Canada and the UK. And their adverse event rate with anesthesia is quite low. But where would you guess Ethiopia is? All the way on the left side of the map. So Ethiopia at 0.46 on the human development index is pointing to about this area on the, on the plot which if we go back to our timeline, it's actually right around here. And that's suggesting that the care, the perioperative anesthesia care that Ethiopians are receiving is equivalent to the 1930s United States care. So it's pretty uh, terrifying to, to, to hear that in a statistics form, um, but some of it is true. So then the question becomes, Okay, is the real problem getting everybody to the physical hospital and it's all these delays in care that's forcing people to die and not get the surgery they need? Or is the problem that when they reach the hospital, they're not getting the quality care that they need? Or is it a combination of both? This is the chicken, the egg problem. So I let all this stuff kind of soak in and percolate while I went to fellowship. Uh, this is Lurie Children's Hospital, this 27-story building is one of the coolest places I've ever worked um, in Chicago. And there is where I specialized uh, and learned uh, how to do airway reconstruction. And this is also when I met Dr. Wagner uh, over the phone and he told me, you need to go to Ethiopia. Um, it would be an excellent experience for me. And I think maybe two weeks later, I got on a plane for just 48 hours uh, and to visit Mekele and fell in love immediately uh, and gave uh, Dr. Wagner a virtual high five back then. Uh, so many props to him. So this is Mekele, Ethiopia, kind of a bird's eye view of it. Um, it is all the way at the north side of Ethiopia um, and uh, is a city of probably over a million. The last census was a, lot, it was a while ago, so we don't really know. And it's the second largest city of, of Ethiopia. Uh, and this complex here, which is the biggest complex in the entire city, is actually the government hospital. Uh, and this has a medical school, a nursing school, uh, and many subspecialties. So this is the highest level hospital within the entire uh, northern Ethiopia area. And so this is where uh, the highest level of care is given. Um, and they had just created a otolaryngology department just a year prior to my arrival or less than a year prior to my arrival. So the idea was, okay, let's try to teach and build up the quality of care in Mekele. And this is one of my favorite pictures. It's just this never ending hallway of patient charts. 
Uh, and it's just amazing that anyone could find anyone or anyone's chart in these like endless hallways. Um, but I loved walking through here minus it did smell a bit, but it was really uh, kind of visually stimulating. So again, back to the chicken and the egg problem of quality and access. I realized that I'm a single individual and I knew nothing about uh, global surgery at the time. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to improve access to care. The, the three delay method is such a complex thing that I knew that I wouldn't really be able to uh, help there. So I wanted to focus on quality, good teaching, good training. So this is what I think needs to happen uh, in order to improve the quality of an institution in terms of otolaryngology. So the overall questions are, how do we improve the level of care and how do we make it sustainable? This is my crew. Um, I miss these guys a ton. Um, and this was the first cohort of otolaryngology residents and uh, attendings in Mekele. We had just gotten new coats, um, which was a very difficult process, but we did it and everybody's super happy. Um, and um, it's all because of them that we're able to create a, a strong program. When I first arrived, I realized that that cohort of residents were some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. Um, because it's so hard to become a doctor and there's so little benefit from being a doctor in terms of financial benefit, uh, it really isolates great people. And all of the residents had every textbook I've ever read memorized and their knowledge was, uh, was intense. But the problem was they weren't exposed to the pathologies in which they read about. Uh, and if they were exposed, they may, it may not have filtered to them because ENT as a specialty was brand new. So the question became, how do we take this amazing knowledge skill, or sorry, this knowledge ability and translate it to skill? And that's also, how do you translate it to clinical knowledge? Um, and by the way, this is kind of just a look at uh, foreign bodies, for example. So prior to my arrival, most foreign bodies were removed either blindly uh, using an angiocath and just ripping it and hopefully it comes out. Or there was a technique where you turn the kid over and slap the back and hopefully it falls out. Um, but this, is, this picture in the center is the very first time that uh, I sat down to teach the general surgeons how to do uh, endoscopic foreign body removal. And so all of the general surgery residents kind of came around and started taking pictures and they absolutely loved it. And then on the picture on the right is one of our uh, soon to be graduates uh, pulling out his first uh, foreign body endoscopically and it was a very proud moment for him. Okay, so keys to narrowing this skill, skill gap between knowledge and pathology, I think takes perspective and I'll explain that in a second. Um, exposure to the pathology and repetition throughout that pathology. So perspective is not just teaching a textbook. I noticed that most lectures involved basically regurgitating what a textbook was written down uh, and, and helping people learn. And, and that's useful to some extent, but we need to create the clinical context. And so we started integrating things like uh, grand rounds that are specific to a disease, uh, radiology conference, mortality, morbidity, um, tumor board, all of these clinical connections that allowed the textbook to come alive within pathology. And then exposure is we had a lot of clinic patients, kind of a never ending uh, stream of patients. So it was important for the residents to be in clinic to see these diseases. Uh, and these are two of our residents uh, actually teaching a horde of medical students um, about pathology. And so I always felt, I always told the residents that the best way to learn is, to, is through teaching. So I always encourage them to teach as much as possible. And then of course, repetition. Again, I'm talking about pediatric airway here, so I'm gonna show a lot of pictures of that. Um, I always feel like it's best for, for people to experience it themselves. 
as long as it's under a safe environment. So I'll always be around them, uh, teaching techniques, pointing things out, um, and in trying to create as many scenarios as, uh, for them as possible. And by the end of my year there, I could say very confidently that the ENT department could take out any foreign body. Uh, it was a very uh, enlightening experience. And uh, before I play this, there, what's so unique in terms of clinical intuition is, is taking what you know is normal, so normal pathology, normal physical exam, and applying it to an abnormal situation that doesn't quite fit the textbook and an ability to notice that something's wrong and identify that wrongness uh, is what clinical intuition is. And so when I had one of my senior residents, Philly, come to me and say, hey, this newborn baby is having breathing difficulties and swallowing difficulties, but doesn't really sound like characteristic strider. And then when I scope, I swear I see something wrong. Can you look at this? You know, it's this moment that shows that improvement is being made. Um, because when you scope this baby, what you're seeing is this massive thing ball valving posteriorly and pushing the epiglottis on top of the larynx. So this happened to be a newborn with a very large molecular cyst. And if this had been missed, then this baby would have likely passed away as the cyst continued to grow. And it's a very easy fix and now, and now that baby's doing fine. The other aspect of teaching abroad that, that I realized uh, is a real problem is predicting the unpredictable. And I know that makes absolutely no sense, but the other way to think about it is always preparing for the worse. And if you um, are ready in terms of the basic procedures, uh, in terms of endoscopy, airway management, um, and surgeries associated with that, when the super dangerous stuff comes in, you can be able to handle it. And so I just wanted to show you a couple examples of that. Um, this, by the way, is, is also another group picture that we're doing, but I do this to isolate uh, G here. Um, he is the funniest guy, uh, but a little bit clueless sometimes. And so we were all taking a selfie with Muhammad, obviously. So everybody's looking at Muhammad's phone and G's just off in his own world taking, taking a selfie by himself. And th this actually happened quite a few times. But anyways, he's also extremely intelligent. So when he came up to me one day and said, or actually it was in the middle of the night and he called me and he said, Dr. Josh, you need to come to the hospital now in a very strict tone. I knew that something was extremely wrong. So after running to the hospital, uh, we see this endoscopy and I'll let it play uh, so that you guys can appreciate the pathology here perhaps. So you can see that the endotracheal tube kind of just like disappeared into blank space up here. And now we're, we're going into the trachea and you can tell this is the trachea because of the rings and then the carina distally. And you can see the innominate artery kind of pulsing away. But you can tell that there's something very wrong. These are the arytenoids and the epiglottis. There's a medical instrument going straight through the neck. This is the esophagus here. So clearly something abnormal is going on here. This is the external picture. Uh, this extremely unlucky lady uh, is part of a nomadic group in Northern Ethiopia that sleeps outside and she was attacked by a hyena. Uh, and the way every other um, big hunter in Africa uh, kills their prey by strangulation. So they'll grab the neck, but they'll just hold on until, until the animal dies from as asphyxiation. The only animal uh, that actually bites the neck in order to kill the patient, or not the patient, but the animal, uh, is a hyena. And so that was the picture or the animal in the picture from the very first slide and is, is my most evil creature. Uh, but this hyena created 
uh, a laryngectomy in this patient, an unwanted laryngectomy, you can see that the feeding tube is blue right here. And, and so there's an injury into the anterior esophageal wall as well. So um, you can tell that all of the skin tissue looks completely abnormal. And that's because this patient was essentially left to pass away in her local hospital for 10 days without antibiotics or feeding because everything was just leaking out. Um, and somehow she survived and they said to themselves, okay, maybe we should get her to Mechale uh, and see uh, one of those airway doctors. Uh, so luckily she made it, but she had terrible sepsis. Uh, so it was a real battle, a multidisciplinary team uh, coming together to treat this patient. Again, this is the referral note from the other hospital, mid part of trachea taken by a hyena, my best, uh, my favorite chief complaint of all time. Um, after we uh, fixed her sepsis, uh, we went back and formalized the stoma, created a laryngectomy stoma, and then uh, separated it from the hypopharynx. This is not her passed away. This is actually her and her child uh, sleeping in the same bed upstairs. Um, this is how they sleep outdoors, so they continue to do it. She has a tracheostomy, so clearly it's not causing that many problems. And um, she ended up doing well. Unfortunately, we lost contact with her. There was a short period of time where she was extremely well known within her community of being attacked by a hyena and surviving it. Um, but then we heard rumor that she actually passed away. We we're not really sure why. Um, and, you know, hopefully one day I'll find the truth. This is a 12 year old girl that actually looked like an eight year old girl. Um, who had been developing this tongue mass that extended through her mandible into her neck uh, since the age of three. And because um, her, she lived rurally, had almost no money, and the father um, felt like this was not a problem and more of a curse, uh, they let this persist for years and years and years and years until she could no longer eat and she was slowly dying from starvation. Um, so she presented to us in a really bad shape. Um, we actually had to do uh, an awake trach here. Uh, and luckily, she was so ridiculously stoic that we were able to do it. You can see the, the tracheostomy site here. And this ended up being uh, a plexiform neurofibroma. Uh, neurofibromatosis is pretty common in Ethiopia. is autosomal dominant. So it gets passed on from generation to generation. Dad had it too. Um, so that was just a view inside the OR. So you can see that what I was trying to show here is the tumor occupied about 80% of the tongue. Um, but we were able to salvage some tongue. The entire floor of mouth was tumor, so there was no salvaging that. And the entire oral cavity had been formed around this tumor. All of the bone had changed shape over time. Uh, it was really astonishing. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and so we had to stage the tumor, because if we took out the entire mass into the neck, we have this big fistula. So we ended up staging it. We took out the neck uh, a couple of weeks later, and uh, this is actually the very first time that she had ever seen herself in a picture. Um, and this is with Snapchat. There was, a, there was an American nurse that was visiting, working in the ICU, and they became really good friends. Um, and then I, she followed up with me months later. She was a master with her Jackson trach and could clean it herself and put it back in. Um, she befriended. Uh, some other patients in the hospital that gave her this jacket. Um, and I just saw her back again uh, in January, right before all this COVID stuff happened uh, and was able to decannulate her. She's eating, drinking, breathing, and is doing great. Uh, and that tumor, even if we didn't get 100% of it, it's so slow growing that we can attack it serially step by step and the, the local team can do that. This is another plexiform neurofibroma, but growing in the larynx of a one-year-old, uh, causing obstructive sleep apnea. But because the local residents 
uh, and faculty were extremely good with sleep-related surgery and airway-related surgery, they're able to handle this themselves, even though it's such a rare and complicated disorder. And this is just for fun. Um, this is a, a vascular malformation of the tongue. He had been living with it his, his entire life, uh, and his mandible had grown around it as well. Uh, we were able to treat that with a combination of surgery and bleomycin injections, and he's now in law school, believe it or not, um, with a functional tongue and is able to articulate and eat and drink. So uh, I only want to take a couple more minutes of your time uh, just to explain this picture a little bit to you. This is a picture of a World War II plane from the UK. So uh, just to give you a little bit of education about history in World War II, if you didn't already know, one of the most pivotal points was defending the United Kingdom against the advances from France. And so that's over the English Channel. So these planes were 100% the only thing uh, keeping the UK safe. So they actually brought in statisticians to analyze the damage of planes that returned from battle and asked, okay, how can we improve the armor of these planes uh, so that we save more of them? And so all the statisticians said, okay, I mean, obviously these are the highest density points. Let's put on armor on these points. Uh, and then finally, there was a Jewish statistician that came in and said, I think we're thinking about this completely wrong. We're analyzing planes that make it back from battle. What about all the planes that actually were shot down? They probably have bullet entries in everywhere where there are not bullet entries in the planes that return. Uh, in other words, we're not actually seeing what's out there and what's being damaged. So they went against their better judgment and they started uh, armor plating these specific areas. Uh, and in fact, the number of planes that returned dramatically increased. And that changed uh, a lot of World War II for, the, for UK. And it's this concept that kind of has stuck with me for quite a long time. You know, when I was in Ethiopia, I kept seeing these very bizarre diseases come in with greater and greater frequency as word got around that there was someone to finally treat these diseases. So in the world, most of the world's burden of disease is calculated through mathematical extrapolation from numbers that we gain in high income countries because data collection from low income countries is not very good. But I don't think that we're actually seeing what's out there. We're only seeing what's coming to clinic. So I suspect that there's a massive uh, unseen burden of disease out there um, that I got, I collaborated with a couple of um, fellow people from South America uh, to kind of uh, work on this idea a little bit and it was published in the White Journal recently. So that's just a little plug, but I also wanted to explain a, a concept that, that may exist out there. And so finally, in conclusion, access to care and quality care, uh, yes, there might be a chicken and egg, but it's more like they existed at the exact same time. And in order for us to progress, they need to uh, improve at the exact same time. Um, however, if we don't improve the quality of care within individual inst institutions, and especially in otolaryngology, it doesn't matter how many patients can actually physically get to the hospital, they're not gonna be treated well. And that goes for anesthesiology as well. So I just wanted to show a couple more uh, pictures. Do I think this is sustainable? What it needs is, is people on the ground that are super excited to keep this work up. And that's what we have in Mechale. Um, there was this foreign body in the left distal main stem that had been in this child for four years. And the residents were able to take it out completely on their own. I just sat down in the back room on the floor watching it happen. And it was one of the most satisfying experiences I've ever had because this was a super complicated case. And it was actually a piece from a, from a computer motherboard. So my final slide here, what you need to create sustainability abroad, I think, is a local champion. 
Uh, I actually saw my local champion try to log into this lecture a couple of times, but maybe his internet wasn't working. His name's Yulika. Uh, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this stuff. Um, so you need somebody like that to, to help you along and to take over that passion once you're not there anymore. You really need the government and local institution to buy in, you know, not only emotionally, but also financially. Uh, they need to identify the problem and want to fix it. That's the hardest part, but I think is extremely important. Then, of course, bi-directional learning. Uh, I can teach, but the stuff that I learn from the local teams has made me such a better doctor, and that needs to persist in time. And then finally, something that I'm working on uh, for my research now is how to utilize these short-term medical trips in a more productive way. Rather than having many trips go to the same place and do the same thing, can we start spreading them around and create a curriculum out of short-term mission trips, kind of building on education over time? That's a, that's a big thing to, to chew into, but that's what I'm working on now. So thank you guys so much for having me. I hope you learned a little bit about global surgery. And remember that hyenas are always watching you. And uh, my email's there, and that's also my Twitter account. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions if there's any time left. And thank you so much. Uh, Josh, I just want to say you've, you've really put it together. Not only do um, you have some of the most interesting cases I've ever seen, and again, airway is about as far from otology um, that I go, but having traveled the world and seen pathology outside of otology, not only are these cases like unbelievable, but you know, your application to understanding the pathology and trying to, you know, create that bi-directional learning experience for these, for, our, for these, these doctors in Ethiopia um, is like, it's, it's beyond me. Okay. I mean, I think your work that you did in Ethiopia, and, and we talked a few times, but I really believe that not only did you help people, but you laid the foundation for, you know, the program that's going on in Mekele. And, you know, I'm, I'm super proud of you, man. I mean, this is, this is the beginning of your life. I mean, I can see that you're going to, you're going to take this to the, to the next level and try to improve education that, you know, needs to be improved, but, you know, and do it in, in, in the right way. Um, I've always, you know, I've worked in 25 countries or maybe between 25 and 30 countries. And, you know, I always try to ask myself, you know, you know, why do some countries work and why do some countries not work? And, and I've always come up with the same thing. It's about your partners, okay? And you've developed a great partnership with these, with these young doctors in Ethiopia. I, I'm sure it will continue for the rest of your life. Um, you know, and all I can say is you're, you're an inspiration for people. So, you know, keep it up, okay? That, that means so much, Dr. Wagner. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you should be proud of yourself because you were the gateway to making all this happen. And, and I very much appreciate it. And, and thank you all. Sure. Anybody have any questions? I mean, um, there's a lot here in a short period of time, but, you know, it was, it was really, especially the hyena case. I mean, whoa, you know, and, and he, you know, you'll find out what happened to her. Unfortunately, she did pass away, as you said, but, you know, just these young children, I'll, I'll never forget some of my airways. I had a guy in Fiji who came from an outer island with like probably 10 years of growing mass in his neck, which was probably papillary carcinoma. And, you know, fortunately there was an anesthesiologist from San Diego and, you know, I, I, there was no way to innovate this guy. So we had to do, you know, at least conventionally, but I, we did a fiber optic on him, got him innovated and then had to leave an endotracheal tube in his neck. Cause you know, there was approximately six inches from his neck to the trachea. I mean, it was, it was a nightmare. So, these nightmare experiences only give you knowledge how to perceive the future. Listen, anybody got any questions? Agata, you have any questions or um, 
I, I have a question, if that's all right. Okay, Misha. Misha's from London. Misha, introduce yourself. Please talk. Hi, hi, Josh. Thank you so much for your absolutely sensational talk. I mean, I, I followed your, your blog and obviously I've, I've met you a couple of times. And I mean, it, it's great to see you again. Plus to hear those stories is incredible. Um, just echo what Richard has said about your impact in Mechala is extraordinary. And, you know, the impact on those young surgeons will go on for many generations, I have no doubt. My question really is, Clearly, the impact that an individual such as yourself or, you know, an enthusiastic, I think particularly young, but an enthusiastic surgeon can have over the course of a year, six months to a year, is clearly so much greater than short term missions. Uh, you touched on this at the end, um, but, the, but the, the way that fellowships are currently set up, certainly in the country that I train in, is that people finish their training and then they go and they learn in other um, high income countries. And there is not a good system by which we get really talented surgeons to go and do things like you're describing, skills exchange, bi-directional learning. That if, you're an in, if you're an interested individual like you are, you can go and do it. Um, but though there isn't buy-in from perhaps the the, the bodies that, that exist, you know, from my side, ENT UK, AAO, I'm, you know, I, I don't know how supportive they are, but I'm just wondering, what's your feeling on the way we encourage that sort of thing in the future? And I, that's an excellent question. And it's so good to see you again, Misha. I hope everything is well with you. Very good. Um, th that's the quintessential problem is whatever we want to create, we want to create sustainability, but what, I did and, and a few others in our field have done is not sustainable in any shape or form um, unless you just move your entire life there. Um, so there are two ways that I think to maintain the sustainability. One way uh, is to change how fellowships are created. Uh, one of the ways we could do that is to create a fellowship in a big academic institution that can, can manage this but to, for example, have three fellows at the same time. You, as a fellow, you can bill for the work that you're doing in your institution and actually earn money for your institution. You can also earn money for a third person that is actually out of country during that time and pay that person's tuition, time, board, everything while they do their international work and then you can rotate. So you can create kind of like a um, global surgery fellowship where you're doing general ENT and learning about global medicine at your fellowship, but you're rotating frequently in, in self-funding because it's just, an, it's, it's very difficult to convince any high income country's government to fund or even academic institution to actually fund this type of sustainability. The other idea, uh, and I mentioned briefly, was why don't we crowdsource what already exists? So for example, in Ethiopia, there are more than 30 short-term trips that go in just otolaryngology to Ethiopia. And most of them go to uh, either Mekele or Addis. And so there's this massive pooling of resources and education in these two areas that already have a lot of education. And in fact, many things are being repeated over and over again. Uh, one of them being ears, which is not the biggest problem in the world because ears require repetition, um, but things like cleft palate, many missions that go to the same area for cleft palate run out of patients because it's a congenital disorder. There's only so many of them. So if we could create a consortium of uh, short-term trips that go to a particular area and say, okay, hey, this area needs this, this, and this, this area needs this, uh, and you want to teach in this way, we can just kind of create like a Tinder uh, for uh, mission groups and or for short-term medical groups so that they get matched up with their appropriate location uh, and they can move around in, in spreading education. It requires uh, a completely different mentality that currently exists for short-term mission trips, but I think that eager people uh, like yourselves, uh, Misha and Dr. Wagner would jump on this idea uh, if it was well organized and beneficial to, to everyone involved. Those are just 
brief ideas I had about it. I think, personally, I think your idea of fellowship taking on, in like in the United States, a third member of the fellowship team, and each one rotates for four months on into a developing country with a set agenda, and everybody finances each other, so it's self-sustaining. Absolutely, I think that's a really, really, I think it's a brilliant idea. Yeah, I'm trying to convince Mayo to buy into it right now. <laughs> I think that's great. It's great to hear that um, that you're trying to lobby at places like Mayo, and I think we need to do the same. And it's, you know, it, it does need some buy-in from some, you know, big groups like that, um, uh, you know, and potentially even benefactors who are interested in part funding something like that, um, because I think, you know, without without that sort of support, it's very difficult to um, to finance. But I I am fully supportive of your ideas, and they're fantastic. Thank you so much, Misha. Good to see you again. Great to see you. Well, does anybody have any other further questions or comments to share with Josh? Please take the time to do so. Otherwise, we're going to thank everybody for joining us. Anybody have any questions? I believe you had something. Hello, everybody. Yuluk is trying to talk. Good, good, good afternoon. Yeah, it's evening here. Yeah, nice to see you all. You? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Walker. I'm good. How are you guys? Wonderful. So, uh, George, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Nice to see you guys all. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you guys. So, thank you for the concern, uh, Professor Wagner. We are all safe here. There is some problem in the North Asia area, but uh, still it's in the borders and Macarle uh, is so far so good. I mean, it, it, it's safe uh, till now. We don't have any communication. Unfortunately, this uh, webinar, it, it would have been, I mean, great if the team in Macaulay actually did the seminar. It's unfortunate that the network is down. So, but anyways, I want to let you know that Everybody stays there, so have no worries. And the government knows for what's coming next. Uh, Josh, uh, I thank you for the presentation, and I want to say again, thank you. I, I mean, we cannot thank you enough for the things that you did. Uh, to I mean, you did the practice in uh, when you first arrive, we're not expecting uh, and then uh, the residents and the local staff, as you know, the airway teams, I mean, we have three programs, but Nagala is still the, everybody wants to be there anyways. In, the, in terms of the scope of practice and the uh, practice, uh, uh, your arrival changes our practice, uh, I mean, in so many ways. So I, I, I really want to thank you in front of uh, um, everybody here. And uh, Professor Wagner, I also thank you to bring this guy uh, back to uh, my colleague. <laughs> so thank you so much. And nice to see you guys all. So I'll keep in touch. Thank you. Yulika, it was so wonderful to hear from you. Uh, I know that there are lots of troubling times in Ethiopia right now, so it's so nice to hear everybody's doing well. Yes, I, I wish the Mekele crew could have seen this, but uh, the internet being the internet, I understand. Uh, I miss you guys a ton and I'll, Come visit as soon as I can, promise.
Um, thank you, Josh. And thank I just wanted to let everybody know, I did talk to Dr. Nega last night. He gave me information as to what was going on in Ethiopia. And everybody who knows of what's going on and all of us included, um, send our wishes for the best, you know, resolution for this uncertain time of political differences um, that exist. Um, but I'm sure over time, you know, things will return to normal um, and our thoughts go with you. If there's anybody else have any further comments? If not, listen, Josh, thank you for stimulating everybody's mind today. Okay, you've been very inspirational. And uh, we thank you again. Thank you everybody for joining. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, Josh, take care.